Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we are going to be finishing up with the answers to the expert level problems in the final day of the 100 Days of Logic. In this video we are just going to be covering the answer to the final problem, which was the modal perfection argument. For this problem, I gave the definitions, I gave the premises, and I gave you the theorems that are used in the modal perfection argument. There are a couple tricks that I didn't teach you that you might have had to figure out on your own. If you were able to figure out these on your own, more power to you. That's fantastic. It's important to note this isn't exactly how the modal perfection argument is formulated. It's pretty close, though, and it will work for our understanding of it. Let's take a look. So, here I've listed the three premises, the three theorems, and the one definition that we're going to use when going through this argument. And we have our eventual conclusion of there exists an x such that x is supreme. That's our goal, s being supreme. Now, in order to get here, we have to do a lot of complicated stuff. I'm going to walk you through it and explain what I'm doing. What, if you know anything about the kind of modal perfection argument, you should know that it's a long indirect proof or that part of it is, at least. So when I was looking and trying to do this, I originally just denied the conclusion and tried to do it there. However, this doesn't quite work. It's not going to perfectly get you the conclusion, and I'll show you where we run into that problem in a second. What you're actually going to have to deny is, say it's not the case that it's possible that there exists some x such that x is s. That's the only way you're going to get the necessary in the right place to work that. And then we're going to have to do a second part of the proof where we go from it's possible that there exists an x such that x is s to there exists an x such that x is s. All right, let's get started. So the first thing we want to do when we have a statement like this is do our change of modal quantifier to move that negation sign in and switch that over to a necessary. Then we'll do a change of normal quantifier. Once again, we move the negation sign in, and we're switching existential to universal. Then we will use m to get rid of our necessary, but we actually didn't have to do that. That's just to illustrate a point. What I'm going to do now is something tricky that I didn't completely explain in my video on modal logic. What we're going to do is we're going to do an assumed conditional proof. It's important to note that our assumption is actually something we've already proven. It's for all x, it's not the case that x is s, that x is supreme. What I'm doing with this assumed conditional proof is, in this proof, I'm only going to use the rules of logic. I'm not going to use any of my premises that I have up there. The reason I'm going to do this is because I want to be able to use the necessitation rule. If you remember, that was one of the rules of system k. It was one of the first rules we learned about, where you can take an axiom, a logical axiom, and just throw a necessary sign in front of it. That only works if you've proven it only from the laws of logic. So we're setting this aside as an assumed conditional proof, and everything we do here is only going to be with the laws of logic. If that works, at the end we can tack a necessity sign on the front of it. So we'll universally instantiate our assumption. Then we'll go ahead and use addition from premise 9 to get it's not the case that x is an s or it's not the case that x is an s. Then we'll do premise 10 implication to get x is an s implies it's not the case that x is an s. And then we will re-universally generalize. We're allowed to do this. Our variable was bound in the first line of our sequence, so this is okay. For all x, x is an s implies it's not the case that x is an s. Premise 11, universal generalization. This may seem a little confusing at first, but it actually does work, and it does follow, weirdly enough. So we can step out of our conditional proof to get for all x. It's not the case that x is an s implies that for all x, x is an s implies it's not the case that x is an s. 8 through 12 conditional proof. Because we did that only with the laws of logic, we're then allowed to use our necessitation rule, NR, to stick that necessary box out in front of this line. So, what do we have now? Well, we kind of have something that we might be able to use modus ponens on with premise 6, but that necessitation is kind of binding everything up. Fortunately, we have modal distribution that allows us to distribute the necessitation to both of our parts of our implication. 
And then we can conclude it's necessary that for all x, x is an s implies it's not the case that x is an s. Now, what can we do with this? Were we just kind of playing around with this in order to see where we get from our assumed indirect proof? Well, not quite. We're actually trying to, even though it may not look like it right now, get a piece of premise 2. What we'll do first is we will universally instantiate premise 2. Here's one of the tricks that you may not have known. We're going to be able to instantiate a specific property. In this case, we're not instantiating an individual, a variable like we did before. We're instantiating a property or a predicate. We're instantiating this f, this kind of general property, like you might see in a for all x, down to a specific property, the property of s being supreme. So we replace all of our f's in that with s. Here, it gets even trickier. We're going to universally instantiate again. This time we're going to replace all of our g's. We don't really have another predicate to replace our g's with. What we're going to replace them with is it's not the case that s, not s, which is a predicate as well. Once we've done that, we end up with this nice thing that doesn't have any of those fancy weird cursive letters and we can actually use for the rest of our proof, which is s to perfection implies that it's necessary that for all x, x and s implies it's not the case that x and s implies that it's a perfection that not s. Fred 17, universal instantiation. A pretty tricky little trick there. Then we have in premise 3 that s is a perfection, so we can use 318 modus ponens to get it's necessary that for all x, x and s implies it's not the case that x and s implies that it's a perfection that not s. Then, because after all that work we got, it's necessary that for all x x and s implies it's not the case that x and s, we can conclude not s is a perfection from 16, 19 modus ponens. It should be pretty clear where we're going with our indirect proof now. We have that s is a perfection, and we have that s isn't a perfection. We just need to tweak these things in order to kind of make them actually a contradiction. What we'll do in order to do that is universally instantiate premise 1, replacing our f's with s's. We get that S being a perfection implies that it's not the case, that not S is a perfection, one universal instantiation. Then, of course, we use modus ponens to get it's not the case, that not S is a perfection. Then we can conjoin. It's not the case that not S is a perfection, and not S is a perfection, 20, 22, conjunction, allowing us to go ahead and affirm it's possible that there exists an X such that X is S. Now, I told you I was going to tell you why we had to do the possible Instead, we had to do the possible because we needed that necessary back in premise 6 to be able to end up with that necessary that we would get for premise 16. If you look carefully at those premises, that necessary is required for the implications in premise 2, and if we didn't have the necessary all the way back, we wouldn't have been able to do it. So we had to throw the possibility in there. But at least according to the theorems we have, we should now be able to get to there actually existing an x such that x is s. Here's the part of the proof that gets a little sketchy. And even if you're not really skeptical like me and don't doubt the first three premises, you might want to take a look at the theorems that are used and think about doubting them. Because when you look at this, we are going to go from premise 24, it's possible that there exists an x such that x is s, to it is actual that there exists an x such that x is s. How are we going to do this, you may ask? Well, through some fancy logic tricks. First, we're going to use T3, theorem 3, which is controversial, and people are not completely sure whether or not that should be the case or not. People disagree on it, but we're going to use it. It's a theorem in our proof. There exists an x such that it's possible that x is s. Then what we're going to do is existentially instantiate x down to it's possible that a is s. Now what we're going to do, because our definition says that all we meant by x and s is this long chain of things with greater than and this is greater than that and there are existing things and possible and all that stuff. So what we're allowed to do is just replace s as an a and fill in all of our x's in that definition with the definition. So we end up with this being completely equivalent to 
premise 26. This is not something that's in question. This is something that's completely allowed. We end up with it's possible that it's not the case that it's possible there exists an y such that y bears relation g to a and it's not the case that it's possible there exists a y such that it's not the case that a is equal to y and it's not the case that a bears relation g to y. Premise 26 and our first definition. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start using some of the other theorems we have. This theorem isn't as controversial as the others. We're just distributing right now the possibility throughout our conjunction. It's actually a corollary of M distribution. That one we can be fine with. Premise 27, theorem 1. Here's where things get a little sketchy. We're going to now use theorem 2. Remember, that's a corollary of S5, that suspicious principle that a lot of people disagree about. We will use that to just magically make those possibilities we just distributed disappear. They never existed. They're gone. Because we're allowed to condense any long stream of necessaries and possibles down to whatever the last term is. Not possible is the last term, so we can reduce that down. Therefore, SA, that's all premise 29 is saying right now, by definition 1. We can, of course, existentially generalize this now to there exists an x such that x is s. That's the problem. I hope that gives you a sense not only of how to do the problem, how to get from the premises to the conclusion, a little bit of a sense of how to universally generalize into some of kind of the new things we were learning about with properties and stuff like that. This isn't how everyone's going to do it, and it's not how exactly how the modal perfection argument does it, but it's basically the same general format. And I hope it also gives you a little bit of a sense of where the modal perfection argument kind of can run afoul, at least to some people's understanding of what modal logic should look like. Whew, that was the end of our final logic problems and answers. We have one more video left in this huge, long, more than 100 video series because we did an extra 30 for Fallacy February and everything going on. The final day of the 100 Days of Logic is tomorrow. Watch a new video every single day until tomorrow. And stay skeptical, everybody.